We welcome you to another episode of Mill Valley's Curtain Theatre Podcast, Behind the Curtain, an official Curtain Theatre production. More information can be found at curtaintheatre.org. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to Behind the Curtain, the Curtain Theater podcast. This is the Curtain Theater in Mill Valley, California, putting on live free Shakespeare in Old Mill Park. Uh, today I'm sitting down with um, a incredibly vital member of the Curtain Theater, Stephen B. Croft, um, who you are also directing this summer's production of Romeo and Juliet. You've directed a lot of productions at the Curtain, but mm-hmm. you know this this year it it's coming up. Romeo and Juliet, you're you know a big one. It's a, exciting, a well known <laughs> show, well known one. Yeah, yeah. So let's start with like right off the bat, like what what made you want to direct this you know mammoth of a play? <clears throat> Um, just to step back, I mean, mm-hmm. if you take last year where mm-hmm. I directed uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona, that totally. was a play that nobody even knew. Yeah. Right? So it took an immense amount of work to change the play a bit, to deepen characters, to get it out there. And there was times like, would anybody come? Yeah. Because they don't even know the play. <laughs> exactly. But they came in droves and they loved it. So it was really kind of an interesting thing to do. Well, then I come to this year and we're doing Romeo and Juliet, which is like an icon. Right, mm-hmm. it's been made into musicals. You just directed Shakespeare in Love, yep. uh, ballet, opera. It's known the world over. You could not get a better known play. Yeah. So why go to that? Um, <clears throat> and I think well, part part of it is because I actually started working on Romeo and Juliet about four years ago. Mm. Uh, I was in Italy, and I was on my own traveling, and I was in a restaurant, and I just I had to play, and I just started writing notes on the sides of the play about how I would treat this mm-hmm. play, what I would do to make it different. Because when you have such an iconic play, how does a director make a new and different take? Mm-hmm. And, and what I came up with and what I'm, I'm exploring in this, so there's a number of different things. Um, <clears throat> one is that I think in general when Romeo and Juliet is done, whether it's in a, in a movie like Zeffirelli or some of the other ones, or when I've seen it on stage, it's all totally about Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. And so what I'm keen to do is to bring the other characters out, to really develop them through character work, which we've been doing for the last two or three months, before we even get to rehearsals, so that when they get to the stage, they're really comfortable in in who those characters are, what their history is, what their backstory is, because I think that's going to add a lot of vibrancy to the play if you have other things going on between characters, which often is kind of let go. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely one thing. Um, a second thing is, is I'm a, a believer that Romeo and Juliet and their story are shaped by the, by the environment in which they exist. Yeah. And the environment in Verona, which is often not really built out to the degree that I think it should be, is one of, of near anarchy. It's a dysfunctional society um, which makes it very, very tough for our lovers to have a normal life, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it, you have to build that out um, to otherwise, because it makes their romance that much more rich, mm-hmm. knowing what they have to deal with in their life, yeah. that they're crossing barricades to do this. But it only works if you really build that environment out. And so in this play, we're not going to start with the prologue, which you know uh, you normally uh, does. We're going to actually set the scene through action and characterization and move, and the whole we're going to start the play effectively with this and then you'll have two households both alike in dignity explained because now you know what it's about mm-hmm. right um, so I think building out the characters um, making setting the scene very well and then the third third thing which I would say is that Shakespeare took the the poem by Brooke and turn it into a much more wonderful thing mm-hmm. obviously fantastic poetry and prose is part of it Uh, deepening the characters of Romeo and Juliet is part of it. But he also took that story and he compressed it into four days. Yeah. And what that does is it means that basically time and chance becomes actors in the play. Yeah. Everybody who tries to create something to, to fix a situation, whether it's Capulet initially or it's the nurse or it's Friar Lawrence, comes unstuck in part because of time and chance and because of the dysfunctional environment. When you have that and you add it to the environmental circumstances 
I like to think of it as a hurricane with an eye in the middle where the calm eye, which is where Romeo and Juliet try to exist. Um, you know, it's shaped by the hurricane, but then you put in time and chance and it becomes just this pressure cooker, yeah. uh, which makes Romeo and Juliet grasp for, for every single moment they can mm. because they know what they're dealing with. They're that mature that they know what they're dealing with. And I think those things put together will shape a very different Romeo and Juliet than people have normally seen. Yeah. What I like about your interpretation and, and what, I, what, what I like is that I think an audience member wouldn't even see it as an interpretation. They'd see it as this is the way the play was written. It's about two households, both alike in dignity, you mm -hmm. know, that are feuding. It's not, you know, that's, that's the first line. It's not, right. you know, two lovers at the beginning of the story. Um, you know, you're not setting it in some other period. You're setting it, you know, in the, in, in the period it was written in. You aren't doing incredibly drastic things and, and, and changing, like, who's who in the story. Like, some small things, like, you know, you're changing the, the genders of, of a few characters, which I think is interesting. And, and, you know, Shakespeare's plays are so fluid already in, mm -hmm. terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of the gender of the characters. So, it, 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 and it works. But it, I, I, I like that while it may look very simple on the surface, the idea of, of putting on a very traditionally timed, traditional period Romeo and Juliet, a lot of thought is going into just all those shades and colors right. that shape this world. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's such a, I mean, it, it, it's, it's something, you know, a lot of theater is either high concept, we're all doing Romeo and Juliet in, you know, 80s AIDS crisis New York and Romeo's a heroin addict or you know we're doing uh, traditional Romeo and Juliet and the director's just kind of taking a nap while the actors depending on how good they are are putting on either a good or a bad show right right you know and so I I, I really appreciate that about you in general as a director that mm -hmm. you're not you're not trying to make it about my interpretation my concept you're not trying to like let that hijack the show you're putting on the show as writ mm -hmm but you're putting as much thought as possible into all those little moments to really in, right. in, enliven and enrich the performance. So if you look at that, that play when I was in Italy four years ago, yeah. and you look at what's on the margin, it's not changing the story. What it's mm -hmm. doing is like, how can you make these characters interact in a way that the audience will get it yeah. and it will add meaning to their relationship to the play in itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's all about creating those moments and the audiences do pick up on it. Yeah. They really do. Um, and I think it, it just makes it fuller and more vibrant and more real when you can do those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's not, you know, obviously we've got a ton of that with you as Romeo and Dale as Juliet, but it's, it's, it's why is the relationship with Capulet and Lady Capulet the way it is? Mm -hmm. Well, let's go into the background and figure that out and, and how do we get there? What is the story and, and how are they feeling about each other? And then that starts to shape how they interact also with other people when the mm -hmm. nurse is there, for example. Um, so you can do them just straight up or you can start thinking about all these nuances which make it a richer experience. Yeah. So, so over the last two, you said four years ago you picked up this play while you were in Italy and you yeah. started just taking notes. When did this concept really like come to you? Like the, the idea of what you've described as the hurricane and Romeo and Juliet being the eye of a hurricane. Right. Um, that really came when I decided, after we did Two Gentlemen of Verona, mm -hmm. um, Michelle came to me, the artistic director, and said, what do you think? What should we do next year? Mm -hmm. And there was talk of Midsummer Night's Dream, which I have no take on at the moment, so I didn't want to do that. There was talk of somebody else doing Symbolon, and they said, well, you know, what do you want to do? And, and so I, I thought about it, and, you know, basically, I'd done a ton of work on Two Gentlemen of Verona, and I was yeah. tired. Uh, so it took a little while to get, get just kind of normal again after all that, but then I thought, you know, I looked at that play again, that I really want to do this. I, I just, this is such a beautiful play. It has the most exquisite language, in my opinion, ever written. Um, it has tremendous characters and stories uh, in it and I just felt it, it would be a wonderful thing to do. I think the company is at a stage where we can do it mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it would be, could be really special. Yeah. So I, that's when I just, it took a while and then the concept of, you know, the hurricane and, and the eye of the hurricane, 
it, it came about for various reasons. It, because I'd always felt that you had to create this environment, this dysfunctional environment in Verona, otherwise you cheapen the struggle of Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Um, and then that brought the analogy of, of a hurricane in the eye within it from that. So it was, I really almost started with that sense of you must create the environment. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise you just won't get the story for Romeo and Juliet, Juliet being all it can be. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I can tell this is like, this is a, this is a the play that, that meant a lot to you for a while. Oh, yeah. What's, you know, you clearly have a very close connection with Shakespeare and, 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 and with this, with, with this, this work. Like, <clears throat> When did when did the bug bite you and and what what do you love so much about it? You know, it's interesting. I I think I said on the other uh, other blogs we were doing that I I loved Shakespeare from the moment I heard it, mm -hmm. like literally. Um, and then I was fortunate enough in school to in grade ten to do a whole year of just Shakespeare, mm -hmm. which was pretty remarkable for a town of fourteen thousand in rural Canada back then. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it was a pretty good school. I actually had to do Chinese history and stuff like that as well, and international politics. So it was a pretty extraordinary school. But but that really meant a lot to me. And that from that point on, I started to not just read all the plays and watch what I could, but I started reading around it. So if you go to my house, I have a lot of books from because I do foreign policy analysis. That's what my degrees are in, and economics and other things. Mm -hmm. But the biggest part of my library is books about Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know going into the plays and literary criticism and different interpretations and, and what have you so it's always been a, a huge source of a passion for me mm -hmm. and this play has always meant a great great deal to me and I've always wanted to do it uh, and do it justice I would yeah. say nice. and, and, and you know um, as so you studied this this, 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 this this play a ton you said you got to study, you know, study, study, you got to study Shakespeare a lot when you were yes. uh, doing, you know, doing, doing your, your, in your schooling and with your, with your degrees. What, what do you think this play says today? Like, you know, it, it's a play that's been, I mean, this is the most, one of the most produced plays in the world and right. it's been done in, you know, every <clears throat> era since it's been, since it's been written. But what do you think, like, like why, why, why now, why here with this, with this, this play? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, why is Romeo and Juliet so popular? Mm -hmm. I mean, a whole bunch of people die in the end, yeah. including our two heroes, right? Mm -hmm. um, the stage has been littered with people who've been broken down by this dysfunctional environment and the problem that exists there. And it just, if you look at the play, and the way I'm going to do this as well, by the way, is that everybody who tries to change something, to make it better, whether it's the prince, or it's Capulet initially, or it's the friar, or it's the nurse, or it's Romeo and Juliet trying to create this beauty within their, their eye of the hurricane, mm -hmm. they all get torn apart by the combination of the environment, time, and chance, which is what I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. To the degree that it actually, it almost burns the thing down to the ground. Yeah. You know, and you could say that's really, really grim. But I think it, you, sometimes you ha have to burn things down to the ground before you can resurrect it. And that's yeah. using a, a Christian word, but I do it inten intentionally. Yeah. Um, w once you get to the point where everybody's lost everything, then you can actually recreate something anew. From the bot, and so our play is going to end with a song, which, while sad, brings this idea that things have been learnt, and it's 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 going to going to change in that. Um, so I think part of it is I think there's a story for humanity. Like you know, you could easily do Romeo and Juliet. This is not Montague and Capulet. This is Republican and Democrats, right? Mm -hmm. You could. That's a pretty see, easy thing to do. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think the nature of humanity is we get caught up in our struggles and take positions and don't think about the other side and it has massive consequences. Mm -hmm. And you see that in Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. You see it in the world today as well. Um, what I think is, is interesting, apart from the beauty of Romeo and Juliet, is I think you have to do it in a way which so, shows that after all this terrible things that have happened, that there is actually hope that things are gonna get better, that human humanity can learn. Uh, and I, you know, whether it's my own personal beliefs or whatever, I, I think there's, that's an important message to have. So I think 
that's one reason to want to do it and to try to get something out of it. The other thing, you know, simplistically is, you know, when I said, you know, why do people like Romeo and Juliet? And I think it's because the language and the story of our two lovers is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It is just, when they're in that eye of the hurricane, it is just so exquisite. And I think people want to believe that love can be really be that. Mm -hmm. That it can be this special and incredible meeting of minds and hearts and souls. And, and they want to believe it. And, and I think they come because they want to see that. Yeah. And I think if we do it well and, and, and the lines are all you know, expressed very, very well and the characters have been built up from the ground up with all their backstories and all the conditions, then I think people will really be moved. That's what I hope. Yeah. No, totally. So we've talked a lot about, you know, the, 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 the conceptualizing of this story. But, you know, as a director, you have to go through a lot of different parts of the process. Yeah. So the next part is, you know, finding the team, finding the people to work with. So you had to, you know, cast the show. Right. And what was it like finding actors to play these, these characters who, who, who are almost like you know, iconized in our culture. You know, everyone knows who, if you mention Romeo and Juliet, everyone knows who they, who they are. Everyone knows who Mercutio is and, and you know, lots of these, lots of these people in this story, mm -hmm. Shakespeare people, all have a, a, an opinion about it. What was that process like, of like finding who's gonna, who's gonna fit into this world? Um, you know, it, it, it's always when you start it, mm -hmm. it's very nerve wracking. Yeah. <laughs> You're a director, you've done it too. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always nerve wracking, but I, you know, I knew we had a lot of pieces within the company mm -hmm. that could potentially do roles and ne nothing is precast, but you know, we had people that, you know, could do some of these roles. And then, you know, frankly, I was just blessed by getting a lot of really good new people to come out as mm -hmm. well, you know, to the point that, you know, I've aged Romeo and Juliet up. Mm -hmm. Like in, in the original, Juliet is 14. It's not said how old Romeo is, but the thought is he's a little bit older as a teenager. And, and we've, we've aged that up for very specific reasons. So the Juliet is maybe 19 mm -hmm. and Romeo is maybe 21, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and that opened up a lot of possibilities for those two roles. It also shaped that, well, so that means Benvolia can be different and older as well. Yeah. So it creates opportunities by doing that. Um, and I think you know, I was again very blessed with the people that we've got. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm very, very happy with that. I had ideas, as you mentioned, I've, I've changed a few roles. Um, yeah. So Petra, which is a, a comic role, I've combined that with the Paris's page to have one person called Petra and I've made it a woman. Mm -hmm. Why did I do that? Um, well, there's an actor there called Lindsay Abbott who I thought was brilliant and <laughs> very comic and can do it. So yeah. you, you do it. You just okay. change it to make, you know, make use of what you have, right? Um, the Prince, I, I knew from the beginning that Heather Cherry could do it very well. She mm -hmm. was my King Henry IV, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so very, very good. Um, you know, and then Benvolia, we changed, it was, it is Benvolio. We changed it to Benvolia and I have a woman in that because I think it wasn't for the purpose of, you know, just getting more women is because I felt that you could create a relationship between Benvolia and Mercutio, which would add additional interest yeah. to the audience. Mm -hmm. So the three friends of Romeo, Mercutio, and Benvolia have grown up together all their lives. They're changing, circumstances are changing. I don't want to go too much into that. But also one of the changes is Benvolia is suddenly realizing that she's in love with Mercutio. Mm -hmm. And so it creates a totally different dynamic that you can play with and make interesting for the audience. Totally. Yeah, and 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 and, 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 that, and that stuff's kind of that stuff's that stuff's great. It, it 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 gives a new fresh take on this play while still keeping it inside like the the traditional world that it, that it exists in. Um, and totally, I mean, like every every actor brings their brings their flavor. They bring their sure. ideas. They bring their thoughts to the the performance. So then, and we haven't gotten into here as in production yet. But then you get into actually the day to day got to go to rehearsal got to, so what's your like technique as a director like what do you what do you bring to rehearsal what do you how do you work with actors I'd love to hear about that sure um, as you know when you're a director you do a ton of work to prepare right totally. uh, and you can't do that work for me I've been looking at this by on and off for four years right mm -hmm. and intensively for the last you know nearly well about eight months mm -hmm. and then I mean really intensively so you're not going to do that without having strong ideas about 
the way scenes should go, how to block it, how the characters should develop, how they do. But then what you do is you take that and you work with characters, with people beforehand in character sessions, and you bring out stuff. And as you use in your Meisner technique, your marination, they, yeah. they develop their own things. And, and then what you do is you get and you have ideas, but then you also, you know, okay, you got an idea? Let's roll with it. Let's try it, you know? Um, and just play with it. And, and then you get the best of both coming forward. And the, the classic example was last year, if you remember, when we did you know, the really crucial scene in the end mm -hmm. where Valentine ends up fighting, fighting Proteus and the, you know, Julia and Sylvia are there and it's this cathartic, amazingly volatile, emotional scene. And I really hadn't done anything for that. And we just workshopped it. Yeah. We did it like two or three days in a row. And the end product was brilliant because everybody was throwing in ideas to it. Yeah. You know, I've got to be the one who says, eh, well, we got to kind of keep that kind of framework. But then within that, let's, let's do it. Yeah, you really, you build the sandbox for all of us actors to play in. Right. And it's, it's you know, and, and, and you bring out our creativity. I love one of the te directing techniques that I, I, I mentioned to other actors when I try to encourage them to audition for the curtain is they say, Steve doesn't give notes, he gives suggestions. Because you, you, you'll, you'll, when you have an idea of what the stage picture looks like, you'll tell us where to stand and, and, and get that picture that you want. But... Throughout the early rehearsal process, you're always saying, like, you know, this isn't a note, this is just a suggestion, this is an idea. And because the curtain is the way it is, like last episode of Michelle was talking about, there's no lights, there's no way to draw attention, the actor has so much freedom. I don't have to stand in a, on a mark and hit a light, you know? No. So much freedom on the, on the stage to really just be there and live with the scene partner. And so the freedom that you give with your directing style, you know, you, you, you let actors explore and, and, and figure out who they are in the role. Um, without telling them you need to stand right here and then right here and then right here and right. and say this line this way and say this line this way right because that I think then that would that would constrict us but instead we're given a lot of room to breathe which is which I really appreciate right and, and as an actor myself I mm -hmm. mean I know I like that right yeah. you know if I'm doing Sir Andrew Aguecheek in Twelfth Night you know I'm going to learn the blocking and learn my lines and, and then you just kind of play with stuff and you see what works because you're, you're always interacting with other actors and, mm -hmm. and like you like you say it's like often every show every show should be different yeah. there should be different things there's always the basic structures there but there's always going to be nuances that are different and you need to be able to react to that mm -hmm. that's why you need to be deeply in your character you need to have done the interrelation work and have the basics, but then it's all about you bringing that to life yeah. in the circumstance. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I think it is. It, 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 hopefully, it works. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if it doesn't, we're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that you you know you put a lot of uh, focus on in a lot of productions. This one's a little less so than than, than usual. Is you put a lot of combat. I do. You put a lot of music, a lot of dance, usually yes. in in these shows, like Two Gentlemen in Verona, a show with no combat. No music, no dances. You added, I think, what three dances? There were there were four songs, and there was uh, three sword fights. Right. Um, and so, why? So, so why is that uh, something that you that you that you often employ in productions at the curtain? And also, how are you um, employing that this year with two, with uh, Romeo and Juliet? I mean, the first question is easy to answer. I, I just think it attracts people. Yeah. I, you know, and you can see it. You know when you're there even in rehearsals right mm -hmm. and kids will see swords come out and they all kind of go their eyeballs light up you know? <laughs> it's hey i'm like that uh mm -hmm. so i get it you know and music always is something which brings people around and dance is is, is a lot of fun too so i, I think it just adds mm -hmm. you know it adds so much to the production i will say that I really do not like it when sword fighting is not real mm -hmm. you know when people kind of wave things around and and it doesn't look real at all, so we always go for realism mm -hmm. uh, in that. Um, so I think you know that's why you want to add it. I just think it's crowd pleasing, but it also it spurs the action. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at, at Two Gentlemen of Rome, the opening scene, we created that whole opening scene, yeah. which was non-existent in the play, so that it would build the interrelationship of first Valentine and Proteus as two people that were really, really close that spar and have a fun fight. And then they see Julia coming in and so Valentine says, here she is, you know, come at me. And, and so it's then incorporating all that. So I think you, it's not just for, you know, entertainment, it's also to push the story forward. Yeah. And you can do that 
through music, dance, and, and, and combat. So for this play, um, there's less music in this play than there has been in, in previous ones. There still is music, there still is dance. Second half is a little harder uh, to put in too much in the way of music in that, although there's underscoring, mm -hmm. for example, in, in your bedroom scene, mm -hmm where you have movement, it's almost like a, it's a very compressed semi-ballet mm -hmm. that you're doing. It's not dancing ballet, but it feels like that, the way I've designed it. Um, that'll end up with you down on the platform, right? But music is going to be under, underscoring that whole thing. So that's, that's kind of good. That's the advantage of having Dawn and a band to do this. Um, so there is music, there is dancing. Uh, the sword fighting in this one is going to be, you know, right from the start. Because if I'm trying to create that environment of hostility and violence and dysfunction, that's one of the ways that I do it. Yeah. Uh, and so that's going to be very much in play. And there'll be different styles of, of sword fighting that are going to go on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some, some will be, you know, very tight fencing. Some will be much wilder. Uh, action as well so I, but I think again you don't do it in this play just for the sake of it you do it because it's necessary for the story yeah yeah this this because this is also you know one of the one of those plays that has a lot of yes, combat in it, it does. you know it's four fights written into the script right um, not just it's not something you can just you, you're, you're adding in you're you, it, it's part of it um, you briefly mentioned the platform and so I want to talk about the set a little bit you sure know, you work with Steve Coleman um, the set designer for the curtain. Um, what what were you evoking with this set, and 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 what 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 can the audience expect when they come into the park to see it? Um, so Steve Coleman, first of all, is an absolute genius. <laughs> yeah, he's frustrating sometimes because I he doesn't have internet, he doesn't have an email, he doesn't have a cell phone. So ha I spend half my time corralling Steve, um, and you have to phone and make appointments to meet him and all this. But anyway, he's he's ab absolute genius, and, and it's mm -hmm. wonderful stuff. So when we got together back in September, late September last year. And I started talking, I said, you know, Steve, I'm, I'm really going to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do rowing. And he was excited, just so excited mm -hmm. to do it. And then I started saying, look, I, because I know Verona very well. It's one of my favorite places to go in Italy. Fantastic city. Uh, and I started pulling out pictures of different squares, piazzas mm -hmm. in, in Verona. And we agreed on basically looking at uh, taking as a model is the Piazza dell'Erbe, which mm -hmm. is one of the main squares there. And then he started, well, then I can create these, these alleyways coming in it and, and it'd just be an entrance, but then I'll create perspective as if you're going down an alleyway back mm -hmm. here. Um, and so you're going to see like towers and a friar, uh, friar's place here. You're going to see columns where people can zip behind the columns and interact. There's going to be a, wall, a little sitting wall on the side here that people can either sit on or jump behind and hide. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, a balcony. Um, so it's going to be a much more um, complicated set than we've done for the last two or three productions, frankly. Yeah. Um, to do that, we're getting people to doing pre-building. I had a meeting for an hour and a half yesterday with the construction team on setting assignments for pre-building, when it's going to be delivered, how we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of the producer's hat. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's working with Steve is, is just amazing because he does have so much respect for the park. Mm -hmm. He really, he really does, and he knows how to shape things in that environment on that stage that become really quite magical. And I think this is going to be a good one. And do you want to talk about the platform? Sure. Uh, so there you will find that there is a, it's a movable platform. I we can take it off the stage when somebody else is on the stage, but but during our performance, it's always going to be there. Uh, it's not a big platform, it's sort of like seven feet by three feet or three and a half feet by nine inches. Um, and the purpose of that is in the initial scene, you're going to see that you know people can walk on it, they can fight on it, whatever. But the moment Romeo and Juliet hit that platform, that is their space. No mm -hmm. one else is ever going to stand on that platform again during the performance. And it's important to do that because we don't have other rooms. We don't have something in creating a new room, which is the bedroom or where the tomb is. So this is going to be their place. And I hope that the audience will pick it up very quickly. That wait a minute, this is, every time they're on there, it's just the two of them, except for at the end when people start, you know, dying. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but they end up there again yeah. on that. It's still going to be their, their platform. And I, I'm really hoping that that symbolically will mean something to the audience. Yeah.
Yeah, no, I think it's a it's 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 a poetic piece of of set design, and like you said, because there is no other, there's no ability to do a massive scene change like you could if you had a turntable on the stage, right? You know, because we don't have that capability, it's it's it, this is this is a way of of bringing the audience's eye right, right. there. And you can't even, like, there's no, because you're in the middle of the day, there's no lighting to yeah. make it look different. You just got to create it. Mm-hmm. In general, I am very light on on stuff on stage. Yeah. You know, I try, try to avoid, in Henry the Henry the Fourth Part One, we had, had you know, mugs and some things on there. But yeah. generally speaking, you look at last year's show as well, like, virtually nothing. Nothing, never on, on stage. stage. Really. You know, mm-hmm. I, I just... It just takes up room that we can use for action. I'd rather have the actors create things. Yeah. You know, rather than use so much set pieces like a table or chairs or or whatever it is. So this one's got virtually nothing on it except for that platform. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was um, going back to what you said earlier about you know the two reasons why you do that during the show right now you know one is because of of, of of the story of conflict and finding finding love and and the world tearing this love apart but the other one being that you know this this romance is just so beautiful mm-hmm. and the language is just so gorgeous do you have any favorite parts of the language like parts that just really resonate with yeah, you there's so many both for, for Juliet and 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 for Romeo I I mean I hardly know where to start, you know, but, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. You know, all that whole section, and, and then, um, look, love, what envious streaks do lace the severing clouds in yonder east. Night's candles are burnt out, and jocund day stands tiptoe on the misty mountain tops. I mean, who writes like that? <laughs> I mean, it's just, you, you just, like, just say those two things, those two, you know, pieces, and you're just like, Wow, yeah. this is amazing stuff. Like I and <clears throat> truth be told, when I you know I, I first met my lady Trish, um, yeah, occasionally I would you know once we fell in love, I would send her stuff using Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> thing. I'd leave stuff on her phone with it. She said like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose her. And I don't know, but um, you know she liked it anyway. So she didn't think I was too too crazy for doing that. I, I recently told a friend that my dating game got a lot better. <laughs> Once I started memorizing Romeo's lines, because now I have all these beautiful pieces of poetry to send people. Oh, I mean, it is really just, I mean, you hear it as well in Shakespeare in Love, which you just mm-hmm. directed, because what Tom Stoppard and co. did in that is they take, it's a play within a play, right? Mm-hmm. But they take the some of the best of Romeo and Juliet and yeah. put it in it. And in the movie is exquisitely done as well. Mm-hmm. But the the language is, I mean, one of the reasons to do it is just to, be part of that language. Yeah, it's it's exquisite. It really is. Yeah, and and, and I want to dive. So like uh, after our first character session, me and Dale talked about these characters, and for both of us, we were like, oh yeah, this is my dream to play this role for like the last five, ten years. Like, of course it has. It's every you know every young actor's dream, even every old actor's dream. It's every actor's dream to play these two characters. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you mentioned how that you know like the one of the reasons the show's done so much is we all. We all are in love with this romance and, and this how passionate it is. What would you say is at the core of that? Because it's, it's explored in the play, but like, what's at the core of like, why are these two people so attracted to each other and, and why is it so beautiful to see? Uh, I think there's a few things. I think, first of all, certainly the way we're doing it, Romeo has backed out of the gang. Mm-hmm. He's trying to find a new path in his life that has more meaning. Um, and Juliet has been kind of kept within her house, but she's incredibly intelligent yeah. uh, and thoughtful and looking for other things in life too. So when these two characters meet, there's of course sexual attraction, but there's also this amazing meeting of minds and hopes and dreams. Yeah. And, and the key for you and Dale to pull out is for everybody to see that to the point that the audience is almost just like they're just gripped Mm -hmm. because the language is exquisite it is beautiful but it has to come as well with people who are so deeply into the character that you see that meeting of minds and thoughts and wits and humor and everything about love it isn't just romantic 
love. It isn't just sexual love. It's much more than that. They are able to sustain themselves in an incredibly hostile environment, grasp onto every moment that they can because of this meeting of minds yeah. and hopes and dreams. And it happens instantaneously with them. And it's, it's, it, I think we can do it in a really interesting way, but uh, I, I think it has to be believable. Yeah. You know, and I've seen productions where you just kind of didn't believe it, frankly. <laughs> no, it really just, no, it goes downhill really quickly from there. Um, you know, but I think in this case with you and Dale, I think it's going to work really, really well. I'm very mm -hmm. confident about that. I'm, again, I'm blessed to have you both as actors, so I'm lucky yeah. uh, to have that. Yeah, yeah. So on top of that, I, I, let's let's go into the hurricane around these two. You know, you mentioned it's this beautiful mm -hmm. meeting of mine, but. The reason why this is the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, not the romance of Romeo and Juliet, is because of this world they exist in. So, let's go into a few characters. Who, 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 who is Mercutio to you? Like, <clears throat> who is he? So, Mercutio is related to the prince. Mm -hmm. He should not be in one of the gangs at all. Yeah. But he is. And so, what we've tried to explore with, you know, character work is that he's an incredibly intelligent person. Mm -hmm. Mercutio basically means mercurial changes very rapidly so intelligent but like here there and everywhere back and forth um, and that's emotionally and intellectually um, but he finds his home you know basically when he gets to meet Romeo and Benvolia mm -hmm. visiting the Montague house and they become fast friends for the rest you know, all their time after that um, they fight together in the gang and, and so on and then when Romeo starts to back out Mercutio has got a problem Mm -hmm. Because he's at this point, he's losing one of his best mates, yeah. um, who no longer wants to do what he's happy just continuing to do, and so it creates things in him. You've got to see in Mercutio that there's there's disappointment, there's longing to try and bring Romeo back into the gang. Mm -hmm. Now he finds Benvolius heading that way as well, but now all of a sudden she's starting to look at him in a very different way too, yeah. and so he's got kind of a confusing situation that he's dealing with. Um, he's a person that, despite being highly born, related to the prince, has no truck whatsoever with pomposity or frilly clothes or all the things that, frankly, he sees in Tybalt. Yeah. So he dislikes Tybalt for that, mm -hmm. and then he really dislikes him when he insults Romeo, yeah. right? And threatens Romeo. And that's what causes the fight. Yeah, and in that fight, you know, Tybalt slays Mercutio, so Who's Tybalt to you now? Who, who's his other <clears throat> iconic character in this story? Sure, and and Tybalt is an interesting one because you can play Tybalt in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, to me, he is someone who's very well dressed, mm -hmm. very well knows he's good looking. Yeah. Uh, he's got a strut. Mm -hmm. He's got he's a fighter, but he's kind of a a little bit poncy in the way he does it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to see that in some of the things I have him do using a sword. Um, but he's certainly very, very capable in that. He's in the Capulet household. He's, he's uh, a cousin to Juliet. Uh, and so he's looking, the way we've talked with Ramon about this, is that he's looking to become the next in line somewhere down the road to Capulet. Yeah. Capulet the Capulet household is a big trading family, trading mm -hmm. business. And so are the Montague household. And they're competing on that and trading. And then some things have happened in the past which caused bloodshed that's led to this feud. Well, Tybalt plan hopes that he can become the next Capulet down the road. Then he finds Paris being brought in. Mm -hmm. Paris, who's, a, again, related to the prince on the no noble side, and that would shut him off. If Paris marries Juliet, it would shut him off of an avenue to get to the top of the household. So that's part of what sets him off. When he leaves after the, the Capulet ball and he sees Romeo and he wants to go at him then and Capulet stops him, he leaves that room, A, he's been pushed down by Capulet, so he's not happy about that. He doesn't like Romeo anyway because he's, he's, he's a Montague. And now <clears throat> he's learned ex, you know, after this and in the play that, <clears throat> excuse me, that Paris is now potentially coming in mm -hmm. to, according to Capulet, marry Juliet. And then that's going to take his position out as well. Yeah. So he's got a whole lot of reasons to be angry and to go looking for a fight, and he does. Yeah. 
Right. So I, I have two more characters because I think that there's I think that the world you're building like you one of one of your strengths as a director is that you go so deep into these people. Um, the the friar. Mm-hmm. Like it's what it, it crazy stuff the third largest character in the story. Is the friar. Right. What, what, what 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 how do you how do you how do you see him? You know, the friar can be played a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. I've seen him play as just as just sort of a bumbling character who kind of steps in everything wrong. Yeah. I've seen him played in a very Machiavellian way uh-huh. uh, and I think Glenn's going to take a very thoughtful approach to this Glenn Havlin playing the friar but yeah but the friar is a person one of the things I wanted to create on it is a person who comes from a different background mm-hmm. who hasn't always been a friar because that educates the way that person works mm-hmm. remember that that he's a friar he's not a priest in the church he's not in a mainstream church he's not in a cathedral he's on the outskirts in a small friary is kind of where he is and he's doing it for a reason he's mm-hmm. left whatever career and i don't want to break up you know glenn's thought process but he's left whatever career he had for various different reasons and he's now doing this so he can be part of nature and he can also guide people he yeah. unlike catholic priests at the time who were probably not very approachable he's very approachable so when Romeo wants to get out of the gang, he doesn't go to talk to his father. That wouldn't go down well. He goes and he meets the friar. And he, he takes the friar on as his mentor. He starts to get Benvolia to do the same thing. Um, and so the friar is this character who is you know, very welcoming, very um, honest, and you know, trying to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. It is the nature of Verona in this play, as I mentioned earlier, time, chance, and environment, that even his best efforts, which some of them are ill-advised, mm-hmm. but they might have worked elsewhere, but they don't. Yeah. And so it has a cathartic effect on him. You know, you've got to think of the friar whose plan it was to, to, to get Romeo to go to Mantua mm-hmm. because when he's banished, and then he's already married him to Julia, which is like, oh my God, like to do that, you'd be running foul of the, the Catholic Church, the Capulet family, the Montague family, everybody would be after you, right? But he does it anyway, so he's a bit impetuous as well. But then he gets this idea of a way to basically save Juliet from having to marry Paris by giving her a potion, which puts her asleep, and then Romeo will come back and save it. Uh, and of course, it all goes horribly wrong, but he's then got to come on and face the reality that everything that he's tried to do is laid in the dust. Everything. And you see that from him. You see it from the nurse who's tried to help. You see it from the prince who's, who's tried to solve problems and has plans and hasn't worked. And you see it from Capulet and Montague as well. Capulet is seeing his daughter, who's obviously not just dead, but has committed suicide, which has a whole different ramification in the Catholic Church, particularly at this time, Mm -hmm. as in eternal perdition, right? So this is like everything, every one of his dreams has been just flattened down to the ground. And Shakespeare does this, in my opinion, intentionally. He does it to basically break everything down to the level of its basic elements so it can be rebuilt. And that's why I use the term resurrection in it. Um, that obviously has religious connotations, but it kind of is the one hope for the town at this point is to be resurrected because of the pain and the sacrifice that has happened, that people will learn. And that shake hand, and the shaking of hands between Capitan and, and, and Montague at the end mm-hmm. is absolutely crucial. You can play that cynically. I'm not going to do that. No. At all. Yeah. I'm playing it that that is the hope for things lifting out of the ground and becoming a new place. Yeah. It's... You know, we mentioned the the spirituality of 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 of, of the, the the ending of this play as this resurrection, and I think a lot of this play, at least from from how I've been interpreting it, it, is about like which god do you follow? Do you follow the god? Of, and, and and it's all in that first speech, which you know, while we've shortened it in this version, I think that the theme persists throughout. But you know, loving hate, oh, anything of nothing first create, and all that. Mm-hmm. It's do we follow love or do we follow hate? Right. And there, this is a world where people follow hate and then these two people are trying to decide to follow love and other people join in with them, the friar, the nurse, Benvolia, 
um, and they try to join in and, and, and help foster this love and it's pulled apart by the overwhelming sense of hate but at the end they might actually finally choose love right which is I think a, a, it, it, it's a beautiful story and a beautiful message to send to an audience right and, and remember the environment that Shakespeare was writing this in right I yeah. mean England at, in his world the struggle between Catholics and Protestants was humongous or the Church of England was humongously mm-hmm. serious people were dying and being tortured left right and center and you could say that you know basically he's taking a story from Brooke um, which is about these contending families and he's he's doing that but you could make if you want to you could extrapolate that he's going a lot further than that yeah. too that he's he's putting a message about society that if you don't stop this this is where it's going yeah. Uh, and you know, there's one way out of this, and that's for people to stop standing in their towers and yelling at each other, and actually finding solutions and, and listening to love, as you put it. So, okay. you know, I'm not I'm not going to be too you know obvious about that, but okay. it's it's very clearly something, in my opinion, that Shakespeare would have thought of, yeah, and did think of. I have one more just wait, question to end it off on. Um, what do you hope an audience takes from this? Like we've kind of, we've, met, we've went into, you know, all the themes and all that, but what do you hope from the youngest kid who wanders into the park and sees this play to the biggest Shakespeare nut in the world who's coming to see their 500th production of Romeo and Juliet? What do you hope people get out of it? Um, I mean, I hope from what we began with, I mean, I hope they feel the power of, of the language. Mm-hmm. of the poetry because it is absolutely extraordinary uh, and we need to get that across and I hope they feel just to fill them up I hope they feel that that sense of, of the remarkable nature of the love of Romeo and Juliet and that they can do this in the environment that they, they are in I hope that fills them up as well uh, I hope they feel they, of course that they've seen a great production with you know, great fighting and great acting and great characters, but I also hope they get the message that, you know, look, this this play may seem that it's just Verona that's dysfunctional, but it's not. Yeah. You know, and there are lessons in this as well. Uh, it's not an allegory, but there are definitely lessons in this if people want to take them. And I think there are, there are issues of humanity that are brought very starkly to the fore in this play. And I hope they get that too. So it's a combination of all that. I also hope they just have a wonderful time. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Steve. Um, tune in next, uh, next time, and we're going to uh, dive deeper into this summer's production of Romeo and Juliet. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. Thanks. Thus ends this episode of Behind the Curtain, a production of the Curtain Theatre. The Curtain Theatre of Mill Valley, California provides free outdoor theatre during the summer in Old Mill Park, focusing on Shakespeare and other classics. We do so out of love for great drama, and in the belief that the gathering of audience and artists around great plays in this intimate and beautiful setting adds immeasurably to the quality of life in the community. We exist gratefully through the city sponsorship of the Mill Valley Arts Commission, and Parks and Recreation Department, along with generous community donations. Information is available at curtaintheatre.org. If we do meet again, why, we shall smile. If not, why then, this parting was well made.